Okay. So, uh, let's see. We'll... I'm going to read the disclaimer first and we'll get going. Okay. Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker or registered investment advisor prior to placing any trade. All securities and orders discussed, tracked, and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither Phil Stockbroke.com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of their respective offices, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment security or transaction. Trading options involves risks. Visit the OCC website, www.optionsclearing.com, to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides educational and training services that are meant to teach you the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with the money you can't afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific date or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any losses you may incur as a result of the information discussed in the media identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed in our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously, and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. All right, now we got that out of the way. Let's see where we are today. And I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay. When you when you comment in the um, Q and A box, please wait. Not the Q and A box. Sorry, the chat box. Don't comment in the Q and A box. Um, when you comment in the chat box, please comment to all participants. Otherwise, I'm just talking to myself. Okay. All right. Let's get this screen shared. Um, there we go. And it's. The least exciting screen. There it goes. All right. Bring up the chat box. And we're going to be all set. Fantastic. All right. Today, I think we're going to talk about what we talked about in the morning post. Um, take a quick look at the markets. We're recovering off a, a bit of a sell-off. It wasn't a big sell-off. It was only a, a half a point, three quarters of a point around. And if we look at the big charts, There you go. Why well, out? Oh, sorry, they're not lined up properly. I wish you would do this automatically. It confuses the crap out of me sometimes when I look at it too. There we go. All right. Um, So where were we? Basically, we had a bit of a sell-off. You're up here at 2115. You dropped to 2100. Well, you dropped to 2095. That's a 20-point drop. So if you got a 20-point drop, that's going to give you a four-point weak bounce and an eight-point strong bounce. And that's going to take you back to exactly 2103. That's where we are, the eight-point. This is a strong bounce line, 2103. Is a strong bounce up 2095. So that's where we are on the S&P, and you can see, you know, once you figure it out, but one, you can kind of see by the shape of the others where you are. I mean, they're generally all more or less trying for their strong bounces right now. So we'll see what happens and see if they clear it. Um, once you get past there, you're going to want to watch these purple lines to see if they can take these purple lines back. If this one's way high, it looks up So if you're going to play, if you want to play something, oh, that's an EK. Um, if you want to, the DK fell all the way to its bottom uh, line down here at 186, yeah, almost 18650. And oh, we had a good time with that one though. We had a nice trade on because we've been shorting them from the 189 line over here. That was my call from last week. And we had a nice drop here. Then we had a nice drop. Then we had a really nice drop here today. And uh, that was good for $22,000 this morning. So that's not bad. All right, and oil, um, 
Jal says oil, oil, oil. Oil is not doing anything. Oil is at 50 bucks. It's incredibly dull. Um, let's see if I can find the bigger chart. I don't know why I don't know why you would focus on oil when we're playing the Nikkei in a channel that's been totally great for us for like a week. Um, ever since it went up here and we called a short at 18.9 on Thursday, we had a great drop on Thursday. Then we had actually, frankly, in the in the webinar last week. Let's go back all the way here. I called, I was calling Nikkei down when we were doing our webinar last week. Remember, I had a bunch of them. And then we have that fantastic sell-off right to the same line we're using today, though, to 18,750. Then it goes back up all over 18,9, but to 18,9. Then it goes back down. These are fantastic wins. You back down to 750 again. Then you're back to 18. You passed 18,9. It went flying up. This one hurt, except if you stuck it out, it was really just a quick spike. You know, even though it was a huge spike, it's a quick spike, and you're right back to 18,9, and then you're right back down to 750 again. And now you had another move up to 18.9, a little past it, and back down to 18.750, and then back for an attempt, and another move down. I mean, that's a channel you want to play. If you, you know, when you, if you want to trade the futures, when you find a channel like that, you play it until it breaks. That's where the money is, man. Here, look, see money. This is money. You know, this is what we're in it for, right? It's like, you know, it's nice to make a 500 here, a 1,000 there, whatever, but when you can pick a good channel, like the one we identified last week in the last seminar when we were talking about the Nikkei, and also when we, we took a whole bunch of, uh, in our portfolios, we took a whole bunch of EWJ short positions for the bigger sell-off. But the bottom line is I'm, I'm predicting a pretty big uh, sell-off for the Nikkei. I think this is, I think the Nikkei and the NASDAQ are both topping out right about here. And we need, you know, and I don't mean big pullback, but a 2% pullback of the Nikkei when it's at 18.9, which is what, 19,000, you're talking about a 400 point pullback. That's just a, that's just a 20% of 19, if I'm doing that right. Not 20, I mean 2%. 2% of 19 is, is like 400 points. That's going to take you back down to 15, 15. We're still in the 18th. And we're talking about possibly going down to 15 on a 2% pullback, which is nothing. That's huge money. It's $5 per point for, for 400 point drop. So you're talking about $2,000 per contract profit. That's the kind of stuff I like. I mean, you can play oil for the little squiggles in between here and here, but it's not, you know, it's nothing compared to like playing a real channel like this. So what's the range? The range is right now 750 and we're below the range now. So it's a, it's a place to be long and Back to 1850, but be aware that our, our overall prediction is a lower, lower, lower down to this 185 line over here. At least, I mean, that's what I think, and that's just, and that's not even bearish. That's all that is is having it hit 19,000 and take a little tiny pullback. And let's take a look at a big chart. Um, find uh, stock charts. Here you go. So what was our run? Our run was, well, you can look at it two ways. You can look at this run from 17.5 to 19, and that's pretty much 10%, right? I mean, another 100 and, um, it's 1,500 more points above there. So it's basically a 1,500 point run. And 1,500 is almost 10%. I mean, you know, realistically, you've got a definite, you definitely have a 10% move in here. Wherever you want to count it from, you've got a 10% move. Or basically, you can say you have a 10% move over the 50-day moving average, for sure. So that's right at 17.5. So you have this 10% run off this general area here where you've had consolidation for quite a long time. All right, so if we assume the middle down here, if you're below 17, so you're at 17.250. And 17.250 plus 10%, I'm pretty sure is exactly where you want to be. So 17.250 times... 1.1. Look at that, 18,975. Good enough, right? So, in that range, and this is not, it's not, this isn't science. Let's not forget that. Okay, this is just, you just have to sort of guesstimate the range. So, what are we looking at here? We're saying, well, there was a, a consolidation 17.5 for sure, but there's also consolidation 17, right? And then here is 17 holding up. Here's 18 failing. Here's 17.5 failing. 
So on the whole, if you compromise, you say, well, you know what, pretty much average 17,250 during this time. And that's where you've got some real consolidation, things going up, things going down, but you keep always coming back to that line. So that's what we're going to use, 17,250. Now, if we use 17,250 for that, then you definitely have a 10% move at 975, at 875. And look how exactly it's following it. All right, so that thing is just, it's completely controlled by computers. I mean, there's just, they, they, there's no human beings making this happen. This is being done by uh, trading robots. They're being, they're, I mean, obviously they're being told to go bullish, but they go bullish and they, and they do it in a certain programmed increment. And you can just see what it does. It's day after day, they grind it up and up and up and up and up and up. That's fine, but eventually they've got to sell. Profits have to be taken. Otherwise, there's no point in buying, is there? Well, I know a lot of you guys don't feel that way because a lot of you people buy and hold and never sell. <laughs> and, you, and then you go, what happened to my profits? It's like, you never took the profit. It doesn't count if you don't sell. If you don't convert it to cash, it's not real. You know, and this is why we like to cash out once in a while. Like, nice to actually have cash, and then you redeploy your cash. Um, but anyway, so we have this 10% move here. At the same time, all right, so 10% move here, and like I said, if you count that as a 10% move, your, your pullbacks are around about 350 points. So you're looking at roughly 18.5 is going to be your pullback area, okay? Now, what's my theory? My theory is that it, co it coincides with the NASDAQ, right? So let's take a look at what the NASDAQ has done. The NASDAQ, same thing, same robots, right? Consolidation at 4,650 or 4,700, so let's see 4,650, we'll figure it out. So consolidation around the same place, 4,650 times 1.1, and what? Wow, look at that, <laughs> that makes no sense. 4,650 times 1.1 1 .1 is over 5,000, 5,115. All right, so that, that would be more, but then we look down at 45. What's where are you holding here? See, the, the floor here is that, is about 4550, whatever. But I'm surprised, so 46. Could we make a case for 46? Not really, it kind of was higher than that. I'd say really, so the NASDAQ might have some more room to go. I would even say there's a case for 47 here being the midpoint where, where it consolidated. It's going way back. The reason I was going 4650 is because here 46, then you got 47, and then I was just compromising the 4650. But let's so let's use that. Let's use 4650. 4650 times 1.1 1 .1 is higher than I thought it was going to be. 5115. So we could actually go a bit higher before we get to the 10% part. But now if we go 5115 though, minus 4650. That's 465. So then we're looking at 100 point increments on the drop. So if 4650 is the top, I'm sorry, if 51, yeah. <laughs> I hate math, 4650. Oh. Some reason I can do it in my head when it's quiet, but if I'm talking, I can't do it. Anyway, so on a 10% run, we'd be at 5100. So this is, 5000 is essentially already a weak pullback from a 10% run. So we're pausing here at a weak pullback. That means, that still means that we're very likely to be going a little bit lower. We're gonna test then 49 again, but 49 is a strong pullback from the, from the run that never happened. We never, we never finished this 10% move up. If we come back to 49 and consolidate, then we'll make another run at 5,100. But there, there's an error already because everybody keeps talking about 5,000. 5,000 is not the right number. That's what we're figuring out now. 5,000 is not the right number. 5,115 would be the right number. So we're not going to have a true NASDAQ breakout until we're over 5,100. All right. But meanwhile, that's the range we're going to be looking at there. So we've got the Nikkei. Uh, could the Nikkei in that case could also get up another 100, 100 or so points? Well, not 100 points. It would be four times bigger than the uh, NASDAQ, so that would be another 400 points. So the Nikkei could get up to like 19.5, and um, the NASDAQ would, would top out at, 51, at about 5,100. So that's kind of where we're going to be looking at for the tops of these ranges. But I don't think it's too early to short now because I don't think the NASDAQ's really ready to make 5,000 or 5,100 for that matter. And the Nikkei certainly, 
Here's the thing when you're betting so close to a line. And, oh, by the way, it doesn't seem close, does it? The line on the knee cape is 20,000. For the knee cape to get to 20,000, there's no way it's crossing 20,000 without being rejected. But on the same token, I also thought psychologically the NASDAQ wouldn't cross 5,000 without being rejected. And I don't mean cross it for 10 seconds like it did yesterday. I mean cross it and not be rejected as in keep going, as in um, here. Here's NASDAQ being rejected at 46. Here's NASDAQ not being rejected at 46. That's crossing it, not being rejected, finding support, and moving on. Even though it pulled back a bit later, it still had proven that it could be over that line. And it's just a kick. What's 46? Whoops. 4,600 times 1.1. 1. 1. 506. So either way, we should be over 5,000. So either way, it's actually very weak of the NASDAQ not to be over 5,000. That's the bottom line. It's not a strong move. And the NASDAQ is actually kind of behind the other indexes. If we look at Yahoo, and we pull up, uh, uh, da, 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 da. let's get a chart here. All right, so we'll start with the S&P. The only, the only pain in the ass you have to remember all the different symbols for all the things when you're doing this stuff. So we look at the S&P, we'll do a comparison for the Dow and the NASDAQ and NYSE and the Russell. Oh, why don't we throw in the EK? Okay, <clears throat> so where's Nikkei? Nikkei's purple. All right, so Nikkei's lagging. It's down here. All right, the S&P is this middle one. is the one with the actual uh, candles on it. The red one is the Dow, right in line with the S&P. Purple's a Nikkei. This color is the New York Stock Exchange. They're lagging. And don't forget the New York Stock Exchange is the biggest one. They've got thousands of stocks. So, they, you know, it's harder to manipulate the New York Stock Exchange, so you really should pay attention to that. And if they're not going up, that means there's a big drag, a much bigger drag than you might think. So, um, oh, this is going back 10 years, by the way. Uh, the, so you got the Russell and you got the um, NASDAQ. So the Russell's up here, and the NASDAQ is actually the runaway hit for the last 10 years. But we don't care about the last 10 years. We care about the last one year. And here you see, this is what I was talking about. This NASDAQ is actually quite the laggard compared to the Nikkei. The Nikkei is way ahead of the NASDAQ. If we look at uh, six months, I don't think there's going to be any period of time we're going to find. Three months, all right, there you go, three months, kind of catching up. One month, so there's only a brief period in the last year that the Nikkei is not leading the pack. And even in a two-year view, the five-year view, only in a five-year view does the Nikkei start losing out to the Russell. All right, so realistically, if we're going to do a one-year view, the Nikkei is miles, miles ahead. Now, of course, that's because Japan is miles ahead of us in stimulus. They are pouring a tremendous amount of money into the uh, economy, trying to push uh, the yen down, and they, they're very successful at it, too. In fact, we had a thing today, um, so they did it this morning, right? Um, I had a chart for that, for the end. <laughs> I don't have to read it. I can just look to find the uh, the worst looking chart there. This is again from 130 in 2012 to 80. So that's what, 50 divided by 130? So 5 divided by 13, 40%. That's a 40% drop in their currency's value in three years. That's what's being engineered over there. So uh, DER, their market, <laughs> is going to go up. It has to because the, 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 you know, you're not, you're not changing the, the stocks are a thing you trade in currency. 
So they're, they're tanking their currency, but that's going to drive more money into the market where it's at least kind of protected by the international trade the companies do. And the companies themselves, of course, end up with a tremendous advantage because all the stuff they make in Japan and ship out is very cheap to everyone else in the world. So their they're goods have a competitive advantage. Also, the rate at which their currency declines, think about this. Um, where did I put it? Ugh. I think it's here. Okay, at the rate, and here you go from 95 to 80 is quite significant. That's like 20%, or well, probably not 15 out of 95 is whatever, but it's 15%. So it's 15% in like the last six months. And when your currency is declining 3% a month, okay, so Toyota ships out a, a car, okay, and the car is priced to make them a 50,000 yen car. I have 50, well, whatever the hell, I don't know, I, what, you know, making up a number, a 50,000 50, yen car, which would be way too cheap, um, goes out the door and they've got 5,000 yen profit priced into it, right? So, now it takes a month to get to America. By the time it gets to America, the yen is devalued 3%. So they're getting 3% more dollars so, so in other words, we're going to give them, because the car goes out pricing dollars to America, so whatever 50,000, so let's say 50,000 yen starts out at the basis of 100 yen per dollar, so that's five, a, a $10,000 car, obviously too cheap. But so the, so the sticker on the car, they're, they're pricing it on their end to make money, and they say we need 50,000 yen back to get our money back on this car and make a, and make a profit of 5,000 yen. It gets to America as a $10,000 car. But that ten thousand dollar car at the showroom in America a month later is now fifty three thousand. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, there's three percent more. It's uh, fifty one thousand and uh, fifty yen. Okay, and then by the time they sell it and finance it and lease it and blah blah blah, it's another three percent lower. So now they're going to send back fifty three thousand yen. So now, so now Toyota in America is going to send back 53,000 yen, and instead of making 5,000 yen that they planned on on the car, Toyota is going to make 8,000 yen. So in, in yen, they look fantastic. Their profits are up. Everything's booming. Business is great. And as long as it keeps going down, as long as it keeps going down, this works. But when it stops going down or when it reverses, especially when it reverses, all those profits reverse too. And now they're going to send out a car priced at 50,000 yen where they think they're going to make 5,000 uh, uh, yen profit, okay? And it goes out at an exchange rate of 80 yen. So we divide that by 80. So it's what? Oh, 6.5 is way off of my That <laughs> can't be. Is that right? All right. So, wait. If it's 80 yen to a buck, that's right. That is, that is how it works. That's really said. Okay. So if it's um, 50,000 yen, so it, it, forget the numbers, you know, that it's uh, obviously silly prices for a car. You divide that by 80 and it's $625. Okay. Now, by the time it gets here, let's go the other way, though. Let's say it increases on them. So now, when we go to sell the car, we sell, you know, we sell, Toyota here sells the car for 625, like they were instructed to, right? But when they send back the 625, now the 625 multiplies by, instead of, um, instead of 80 yen, it goes, I'm sorry, instead, instead of, this, the, the 80 was wrong, it should be reciprocal. But instead of it being 80 yen, if the yen gets stronger, they would get less, they would get less yen per dollar. And now they're only going to send back, so let's say instead of 80, it's uh, 78. All right, so they say times 78, which is a very small difference, obviously, in price. And now they send back 48,750. They practically wiped out the profit on that tiny change in the currency. So when you see the yen going the other way, you're going to know that the Japanese manufacturers are in for a hellish quarter. And let's take a look, and here, here you have a time when that happened. It happened in the fall 2014 into the summer of 2014, the last summer. So what do we think, what do we think happened to the Nikkei during that time? And where is it? So now we're going to go back and look at the Nikkei. And see what happened? 
This is what happened to them when it went the other way. They had a really crappy time until they turned their currency back around and started dropping it again. All right, so it's, it's not, these things are not unpredictable. Okay, that's my main point here. So when I'm talking about like shorting Nikkei, when I say we're gonna short Nikkei, I'm shorting it because if not, it's not just about the earnings of the Japanese company and this and that, there's a, a huge macro here going on with the currency because this is support. We know this is support. This is ridiculously low and the only way they can make it lower is for Japan, Japan, and we already know that Japan is bursting at the seams. So their quantitative easing has gotten to the point where it's hurting other businesses. In fact, local businesses in Japan are being destroyed because of what's, a lo what's the difference between a local business and Toyota? Toyota exports cars. They finish a car, they send it out of the country, and they get foreign money in. So it's a win for them, right? But, um, you know, Joe's Sushi Shack in, uh, in the middle of Tokyo, that guy is fishing local fish and paying local fishermen and has local guys working for him. He's doing everything in yen, okay? But whenever he has to buy anything from outside the country, it's costing him a fortune. Any, anything that he needs for his store that doesn't come from Japan is killing him. So small businesses in Japan, just like, the, and the same thing happens with the Russell here. Small businesses get killed on things that benefit big businesses. So, that, so um, Japan is very, very focused on their big business. They don't give a crap about small business. They care about their big corporations. They run the country. And uh, so Japan is really, hey, they pulled out all the stuff. So they're really, really damaging small business in Japan now. And they're causing huge problems and instability. So that, that was, that's been happening for months. And so these are the reasons why, and, the, and here's months. I mean, you can see what the end is. They had to stop because there's a certain point where you just can't make your currency any weaker. It just gets ridiculous. Um, also, you're in a war because Europe doesn't want the yen to be any weaker because they, they also export and they, and they want to be competitive. Uh, America, we don't want the dollar to be that much stronger, so we, we're not happy about it. Other countries, everybody's doing China is easing like crazy, trying to knock their currency down. Because again, they, they compete for exports too. And they had terrible trade numbers because Japan is winning the trade war right now. Japan is winning the currency weakening war and the trade war. Um, so there's a combination of hitting this incredibly, you know, decade long support level here, okay? And also the fact that you, you reach a theoretical limit and, that, and that's the thing that goes back to the same crap we always talk about, though, is that it's value. It's not just a bunch of numbers, and it's not just a bunch of squiggly lines. There's reality to these things that I could spend weeks talking about, but it's like how many yen are there in the world? How much, how many dollars are there in the world? What's the distribution like? What's the printing rate of the Bank of Japan compared to the printing rate of the United States? How much money is being created by each bank in the world? Not each, you don't have to worry about every bank, you worry about the big ones. There's like six or seven big banks that you care about. Um, how much are Japan's exports? What's their rate of unemployment? How much is their balance and deficit? You look at all these numbers and you say to yourself at a certain point, you're like, you know what, that's enough. And the reason this line is here is because back in 2007, the same thing happened and people looked at it and said, that's enough. It can't go any lower. It's no longer beneficial. The policy doesn't work. A weekend policy works for so long and then it stops working. Now here they had a huge snapback, but that was caused by the stock market crashing and everybody started running to the end for safety. That's what caused it. wasn't changing their policy. It was a bunch, it was a flight to safety of the yen from all the people in Asia with their crashing uh, currencies. Um, anyway, so that's why I put a big short on Japan. <laughs> all right. Don't know when. Don't know exactly. It's hard to time these things out exactly right. But at some point, I think we're going to have a big snapback in the Nikkei, and it's going to and it's going to drop down. But what we're playing for now is a nice snapback. I don't need to, I don't need to play for a major crash. I mean, I, well, I take that back. Our EWJs, we are kind of playing for a bigger crash, and we took a bit of a loss the first month doing it. We'll take another loss this month if it doesn't go down. We're, we're, we're good to April now in the short-term portfolio. Um, 
But as you can see today, it paid off. So today it was like I got a nice pop on it for today, and we had a couple of nice little moves down. And now we're actually we're actually hoping it goes up. I'm not betting it's going to go up, but I hope it goes up so I can short it again because I feel a lot more comfortable shorting at 18.9 than I do at 18.7. I want to short at 18.9. I hope we get another chance. I'm greedy because we already have three chances at it. We had the first chance um, this Tuesday. We didn't get to 18.9. We were at 18.7 when we first. This is last week when we started talking about this trade. Then we got to. Then we popped through. And this is why you stop out. By the way, see the thing. It's like we took a short. We went down here. We stop out now. If you tried again at 18.7. You blew it, right? It went past 18.7. But if you stopped out, so what? Then you try again at 18.8. Well, that didn't work either. You stop out. Now you try at 18.9. Ah, finally, we have a winner, right? And it starts falling down. That's a huge winner, though. You can afford a few losses, but only if you stop out. You can't just ride everything up. You have to say that. You have to say, I, okay, I was hoping that would hold. It didn't hold. I was hoping this would hold. It didn't hold. I was hoping that would hold. It didn't hold. And eventually, you catch a nice wave down. Now, once we do catch that wave down, now we feel more confident about the line, then we go back and do it again. And as I said, this popped up and was nasty. That was Sunday night, though. Nobody, nothing real happens on a Sunday night. Um, that was before the Nikkei even opened. They did a spike in the futures, probably trying to get rid of people who were short like us. Um, then it went flying back down. That's a nice, that's a nice thing here, back to 18.8. Then we go back to 18.9 again, 9.50 in fact, and short it again. And then we're into the nice short we had today. I'm not suggesting to play this many as I did, but five, wait a minute. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I still had some. I was like, I didn't want to have any more shorts right now. Um, I mean, I played, I didn't play 30 at a time, but there were, there were 30 different times I made entries on these contracts on the way down. Um, it's um, it's just a matter of like catching the macro trade and and then being there at the right time. So how do we determine stop on the on the Nikkei? Um, Nikkei moves very very fast. It moves uh, really fifty point increments is what we've been playing. I called a stop at seven fifty because we had this one over here and it spiked right back up. So when we got back to seven fifty over here, I called the trade dead over here. But then, oh, I'm sorry, and then it went up and then it went back down. And then we went back into 750 and then we and then we called it again. So we took another 50 point, This we caught this 50 point move here during chat today. And um, then we took a stop finally at a 700 and, I'm, and, we, and we haven't been back in since. Um, you know, we don't determine a stop. We determine a stop mostly by observation. It's like, when, when do you see some support? Well, here you go. This is a good indicator right here. We spiked down, it held, and went right back up. So that means there's some serious buyers around at this point. So next time we went down there, we got nervous and got out, and we figured that then it turned out to be a little bit early. So we got back in again and then caught that last plunge. All right? But now we're not sure. And again, I don't like playing it long. That's the problem. It seems tempting to play it long and say that's a channel, but how do I call that as a channel? I don't have enough evidence to go long here, and plus my overall opinion is that we've got at least another 200 points to drop on the Nikkei. But on the other hand, I know for sure this thing bounced like crazy from seven, from from here and jumps up 100 points, jumped up 200 points over here. So I'm not very enthusiastic about playing it short at 18.7. It's just, you know, we caught a good run and that's it. We're going to have to walk away or we'll have to just uh, watch it now and observe when we get to another good spot to short. You know, it's like the Russell, though. We were also playing the Russell, and that was easy pickings. I mean, the Russell was perfect for us, because yesterday we got it at 240, and we caught this run down to 30. Then today we got 30, today we got 40 again. I'm sorry, I wasn't saying it was the last thing. Uh, today we got near 40, but we could, you know, we talked about this morning on playing 37.50 or 35, and we caught this nice run down. You know, so there's always something to play if you want to play. You don't have to, but you want to pick the one that's the most obvious, that has the best lines to enter, like 4,400. Uh, we had 44.60 on the S&P today that we called also, and that went down went down 20 points. 20 points is a nice move in an index. Uh, let's see. I'm back in the back track and make sure i got questions uh, taken care of. Okay. So Wayne says, does an EKN relationship you discussed relate to the Euro uh, DAX? If euro is weak because of stimulus, are you considering going long the DAX in the current Europe stimulus environment? Ah, 
Um, it's different because Germany exports so much to Europe. You know, it's not the same thing because Europe, they've all got the euro. Um, they don't benefit as much from a weak euro because a lot, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like a state. It's like saying, um, does uh, Michigan benefit from the weak dollar? And you're like, well, yeah, when they export, but it doesn't really help them inside the country. So Europe is like a, a country and, and Germany is like a state, although it's obviously the biggest super state of the country. So it's more like California for, for Europe. Um, but the point being that, yes, there's a benefit, but it's a mitigated benefit because they do so much business inside the Eurozone where it doesn't help them. Then you also, you have to look at your imports to export relationship and all sorts of other things. So. Uh, would I go long on the DAX in the same environment with the euro dropping? Yes, I would, because Germany becomes a safe haven, and if the euro does collapse, people want to be in Germany. They don't necessarily want to be in most of the other countries, so you want to be in countries that are in Germany, in companies that are in Germany as well. Um, but I, I don't play the DAX just because we don't get good information here. Uh, the thing about playing the futures for me, and this stuff applies, of course. But the thing about playing the futures for me, I'm in I'm in New Jersey, um, so I'm playing on Eastern Eastern Standard Time, same same time as New York Stock Exchange. So, and and also my TV, um, I could I guess with effort I could probably go, you know get a European version of CNN or Bloomberg or something like that. But what I have on in my house is I have Bloomberg and I have CNBC on two different TVs in two different rooms. So whenever I walk around, I hear all the different stories that are going on. And uh, all my scans are local. And, and, you know, if you want to, if you want to be motivated, who's eating chips? <laughs> Somebody's not muted. Hang on a second. Uh, da, 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 da. How do I figure this out? I don't know if you can tell who's making noise. Well, whoever did stop, so thank you. I guess you knew you were eating chips. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully that's taken care of. For some reason, sometimes it misses muting people when they join. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, so it's easier for me to just sit down and do my U.S. trading so I don't bother with the European index because you don't want to be in a futures trade where you don't have a high degree of confidence that you're going to hear news as soon as it happens, all right? Now, I play the Nikkei, and when I do, I'm watching the, the news streams from Japan. I've got my Bloomberg news stream from Japan up, and I'm, I've got, a, um, I've got a, a, the other news on the um, EWJ. I'm watching on Yahoo Finance. I'm looking in case something happens, but uh, I don't have the same level of alert. So when I do play the Nikkei, I have to play it a lot looser that I play the U.S. stuff, because in the U.S., if I hear something about an index, and I go, I hear in my ear, like, something happened with oil, something happened with this, somebody said something, I know exactly what, how that affects the market, and I can react immediately. Um, when it's something far away, like the Nikkei, I'm, I'm not going to hear about some minister in Japan saying something, even with the best connections, even with the Bloomberg terminal and all that, I'm not going to hear about it for 15, 20 minutes. So the Nikkei is going to move, and I'm going to have no idea why. So my only resolution, another reason why I don't like to play the Nikkei if it's not in a, in a good channel, is I don't have the ability to react that quickly, so therefore I have to keep a very wide channel, means I expose myself to a large loss. All right? so. That's how I feel about the DAX. If I lived in Europe, I would play the European indexes, and, and I would probably study those a little more closely, but I don't, so that's my best answer is to say it's similar but not equal, and you have to be careful of those factors when you're looking at it. All right, so let me see. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed somebody. Uh, Bernie said, I'm really interested in hedging to protect my long skates So That's right. That was going to be our topic today. So I'm going to get to that as soon as we're done with this discussion of the uh, current case in the market. Jal says, what would be the range? Jal, what was that? Uh, range of what? Not oil, I hope. Oil range is 59 to 49 to 51 at the moment. That's what we're, we're bouncing between 49 and 51. I wouldn't play oil unless it was under 40. You know, unless it was close to 49, I would go long. At 51, I would go short. I don't feel very strongly either way about oil moving. Over the course of the next six months, I think it's going to go to 60. So my bias is a little bit long. I feel better playing long at 49 than I do playing short at 51. Because if it went higher, I wouldn't be shocked. 
Um, but I, I think you're in a kind of a range that's, that's fairly dependable at the moment between 49 and 51. So if that's the range you're talking about, then yeah. As to the Nikkei, so far we seem to be holding a range of 19 to 82. I believe the range is 19 to 18.5, but the problem is it's, it's a resistance thing. It's easy to short here, but now that you get in the middle of the range, it could go up, it could go down, so why should I ride it out? Now I'll just wait and see where we end up. If it goes back up to the top of the range, I'll consider that a good time to go short. If it goes back down to the bottom of the range, then we got to see, I got to see it held before I start betting again. So, you know, it's just we had our fun with that one. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, do remind me if I forget to get back to this um, hedging thing. Though. Mike says to buy TM. Well, I think that's right. We did buy TM. Um, is that in that portfolio? I don't remember. There it is, Toyota. I think we had some. I wish we had more. But we did buy Toyota. We have a nice little profit on it. So uh, when was that? That was way back. That was last, that was one of our early ones last year. So let's see. Let's see how good my coal was. Where is my graph? There it is. So, oh, yeah, it was pretty good. Put in June last year. Aren't we clever? Yeah, that's one that's always on my list. So, June 25. So, you know, we, we have stocks that are constantly on our list. And when they get cheap, now we didn't run out and buy them the second they hit 100. We, we waited to see how they would do. And when I say waited, look at, look, at the, look at the patience here. We love Toyota. We always love Toyota. They went from 130 down to close to 100. Very nice sell off. They, but we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and they, they bottomed out around 105, and then until June, this is when we acted, when they, when they started breaking up and we got worried they were going to punch through the 200-day uh, moving average, we decided to make a buy. Now, had we waited, we could have actually gotten cheaper, but we, we got comfortable that this was good support and it was moving up from here. And this is where we made our entry, right about here when they started moving forward. So we made a very good entry, got a nice gain, and, and, and you know, it was a, it's a modest play, but we're, you know, the, the long-term portfolio is full of modest plays. All we said was we think that Toyota will be at 135 by, the, by this January, and here it is at 135 already, and that was our spread. And, and we spent, it's a five-unit spread, we spent seven minus five, so we spent about 2,000 bucks on the spread, and it's a... $25 spread, so this thing pays about $12,500, I think, off of $2,000 if all goes well. That's fantastic, right? I mean, it's, it's a simple little thing that we did. All we did was spend $2,000 in cash buying Toyota. It's going to return $12,500 in 18 months. It's a great gain on cash. And what's our worst case scenario? Our worst case scenario is we would have ended up owning um, 500 shares of Toyota at about 114 net. So this is what all of our trades are like, though. All the trades in our long-term portfolio are like this. It's simple trades that make some really good return on cash. We don't tie up a lot of our cash. And our worst case is we own the stock cheaply. We own the stock at basically where the low of the stock was during the time it was trading. That's why we got comfortable. See, when we see that bottom, when we saw this bottom here at 103.38, the spike bottom, we said, well, 105 is holding. We get to here, and we can still construct a trade that gets us in at 105. So all the way up at like 115 or 110 something, we say, wow, I wish we would have bought it at 105. And we say, well, yeah, we could buy it at 105 because we know how to construct an options trade. So we set up our options trade so we do buy at 105. So if it does dip again, we don't miss anything. We get our entry where we wanted to own the stock. As it turned out, it never went that cheap again. We don't own the stock, but we have the contract that will pay us off, <clears throat> what, six to one. And six to one over eight, over 18 months is uh, uh, one-third of a – is what, 30% 30 a month average gain. Not bad. 
All right. So Mike says he bought Fanuc, who make robots. We like robots. We like iRobot in America. Of course, Fanuc is much bigger than iRobot. Um, they build all the Apple products, do they? Well, they got rid of all the Chinese kids. Um, Tesla causes Tesla robots are awesome. And they will make humans obsolete. You're right about that. Do they have robots building the robots yet? That's what I want to know. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what's really over for us. When we teach the robots how to build more robots, then we're screwed. So, yeah, great company. I mean, it's, it's an unfortunate trade over here, but that's a great, great company. Uh, let's see. How do you determine stock on the Nikkei? We talked about that. Can you review the 5% rule on the indexes, please? Oh, Chrissy. Why don't you ask me this stuff in chat, Chrissy? So much easier. Um, let's just do one. We're going to do the SPY because the SPY – no, let's do – well, we, we did the NASDAQ. We kind of talked about it. I mean, let's do the SPY uh, – not SPY. Let's do FTX. Let's get – we're on the big board chart now. We can do FTX. All right. In, in a short-term trading, you want to look for your consolidation line, okay? Now, on our big chart, where is our big chart? Let me put that up today, right? John Luke made it, and it was up here somewhere. There it is. So we haven't moved the lines here. We're having a debate about changing our lines. So, what, you know, if we do get a proper breakout and the NASDAQ holds up, we're going to have to move these lines at some point. So 1850 was our last one. 2035 is the 10% line. We did not adjust this to the dollar, though. So it's kind of hard, you know, if we, since we haven't adjusted for the dollar in a very long time, you have to be flexible about your line. So we want to do observation. But since 2035 was where we called it, son of a bitch, that is the right line. Though. Look at that. Here's 2035. All the way back there. See, up and down, it's up and down, it's up and down, but that's the right line. So 2035 is the correct line, all right? And if 2035 is the correct line, it's very simple. Then we say times 1.05 is 2136, all right? So that's what you're going to look for as the, as the next breakout. 2136 would be the next top on the S&P. Now, let's find out what the 2.5% line is. It was uh, 2035 times 1.025, 2085. All right, so you look for 2085, which is right here. And you see how it stopped over there, too? So 2085 seems like a good line. So 2085 is going to be the 2.5% line off, 20, off 2035. So it's really 12.5% above what we're looking for. So at, at 2085, we're going to expect to see some resistance. At 20, uh, whatever I said before that, I forget now. But at uh, 21, whatever the heck it was, 20, we figure, figure like around here, 21, 25, 21, 30. Those are, those are your significant lines. So basically 50 points higher than 2085. So two, oh, it's 2035. No, no, no. 2085, 2135. That's what it is. So 2085 and 2135 are your key lines on the S&P. That's 12.5% and 15% over the must-hold line. I'm sorry. Uh, oh. <laughs> yes, over the, that is correct, over the must-hold line, which is way down here. That's like 1850. And see how the must-hold line works? It's way out here. So this got broken ages ago. We already had a nice retrace. We already had another retrace here. We, we held the... Strong, we held the retrace line at 2,000, and that solidified it for a breakout. So once we got over here, we're probably solid. It's very unlikely we're going to fail this 2,000 line, which is why we're not looking for a big pullback. But a pullback from 2,100 to 2,000 is 5 percent, people. That's, it's not a big pullback, but that's 5 percent. We'd love to see a 5 percent pullback on the indexes. So that's, that is what we're looking for, the retest one more time of that thing. Oh. Somebody's making, okay, whoever's typing, you're not muted. I wish I could make this work right. I really have no idea how to make this happen. Wait a minute. Maybe there's something I can do here. Nope. 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 You 
audio connection options. I think that's my audio. Turn off feedback, change feedback, invite and have others view all attendees. Sorry about this, I just have no, all right, audio connection mute. I'm trying to see if I can, I don't think you guys can see what I'm looking at, but I'm trying to find if there's somebody. Okay, how about this? I don't seem to be able to do anything about it. It's very upsetting. All right, one more thing I'm going to look at. I'm baffled by this. Audio connection, that's my audio connection, it's not your audio connections. All right, so hopefully the person who, who was typing realizes they were making noise. Participants. Damn it, it's so annoying. All right, sorry about that, folks. I, do, I cannot for the life of me figure out how I can meet people at the moment. All right, <clears throat> back to work. Um, Bernie says, so I know this is off subject. Well, first of all, you got to type to all people. Do not type to just me. But can we look at the openings and new hedges and downside of the SB? Yes, it's not off subject. That's the subject we were trying to get to. We're just kind of doing some general stuff now, but it's been an hour. Chrissy says, trying to figure out your calculations on NQ. Do I subtract 5,000 minus 4650 is 350, 27 is a little pullback. Okay. Chrissy, on the NASDAQ, since you don't want to look at the S&P, well, I guess I probably did that after you started. All right, but let's take a look. So you're, you're – the point is you have a run from 4,600 to 5,000, right? So that's a 400 – point run. And if you're going to look for a pullback, you're going to look for a pullback of 20% of 400. Oh, I wish somebody would read. John. Aha. John Shields. It's you. <laughs> I just figured that out. Can you, all right, John, please, if you ever want to mute yourself, I'd appreciate it. All right, let me see if I can do something on this end since he doesn't seem to hear me. Oh, maybe he did. Maybe that's what he was touching. All right. Let's see. Um, so, no, you don't, you don't subtract. What you're looking for is you're looking for a move that's going to be 5%. So you've got this 4,600 line shaped up as support. Then you're going to look for a 5% move. Now, we decided the 5% move was actually higher than 500. So you take 4,600, 4,600 times, well, 1.05 is 4,830. So that's the 5% line. So what you should be doing is like noting these on the chart. So that's the 5% line is 4,830. Then, but you know you passed that, so now we're going to say 4,600 times 1.1. 1 .1, that's your 10% line, 5,060. That's the extent of the run. And... Um, Hang on. Still making noise. Sorry, guys. Maybe I'm the only one that can hear this.
Okay, that fixed that. All right. <clears throat> so, um, where was I? Oh yeah. So, you run is the, you run your the real run. It didn't happen yet. That's the problem with the five percent rule. That you have to kind of get used to is it predicts the future. It doesn't matter if it didn't happen yet. The rule is still in effect. So you have a run from forty six hundred to five oh sixty. That's four hundred and sixty points. So four hundred and sixty points. You're going to have pullbacks of twenty percent. So zero times point two is ninety two. So you're really looking from forty uh, from well, I forgot the main number now. See what I got to write it down. So from 4,600 times 1.1 1 .1 is 5,060. And we're going to be looking for basically 100 point pullbacks pretty much from 5,060. So figure you're going to be looking at something like 49,60 and 100 points below that is going to be 48,60. So roughly, roughly 48,60, you know, 48,60 and or 48,75 maybe. And a little bit higher is maybe 50, uh, five, it's hmm, 49. So I'd say 49.75 is probably going to be a good line to watch. Let's try to do this exactly now. So it's um, so it's 460 point run times 0 0.2 is 92 points. So then we say so 44.60 minus 92 is 43.68, but the NASDAQ tends to draw itself to 25 lines, so I would call it 43.75, and then the next one I would drop down to maybe about 43, uh, uh, 43 on the dot, 42.75, something like, wait, not 43, well, you know, that should be 49.75, so, 40, so 49.75 is probably going to be your first pullback line, and now, by the way, so when you calculate your pullback lines, that's a weak reach, and that was off the 10% run, 49.75 is a, is a retrace line. Since you're consolidating at the retrace line, that could be a sign that you're just not going to make this run because the, the, the pullback of the run is having resistance. You're already hitting resistance at the point where you would pull back if you had a full run. So you can't even get past the pullback line. That's not a good sign. If we fail that, the next thing you're going to want to look at is another 100-point pullback down to around 4875, 4900 in that range. So if 4900 holds, that's a nice bullish consolidation. If 4900 fails, though, then you're going to start having to look back here and say, wow, where are we going to go to? And we're probably going to come and test this 50-day moving average, which is down around 4775. So it's another 100 points down, and you're going to get a test. So then you like get a two thirds pullback at that point. Um, so that's all you do. It's just a series of calculations of moves and retracements. And if you want to learn some stuff, uh, Chrissy, yeah, first of all, I've written a few articles on how the five percent rule works in general. Second of all, if you study Fibonacci retracements, there are uh, works of literature on that. There are there are tomes written on Fibonacci. Um, if you go and check out those, you'll learn a lot about the, it's the same concept as what they call a Fibonacci retracement. And there's Fibonacci lines and Fibonacci numbers, and there's courses toward universities about this stuff. And if you just get yourself a good book on that or a couple of books on that and you read through those, they're going to have endless explanations of this kind of stuff. So you, then, you'll, then, then you'll be able to come back here and say, oh, I get it. All right, now Mike says, not urgent, but if we have time, would we start a new position on SLW here? Um, I, geez, I don't know the quality of that mine. They're buying a mine or they're buying rights to a mine. They don't usually buy mines. So I had to look at that. Uh, if you remind me in chat, I'll check it out uh, over the weekend or something, because that's weird. Um, usually they don't mess around with their own mines. They kind of uh, buy the rights to, to the gold from a mine and somebody else does the mining. Um, Let's see how that works out. But do I like silver? We made, they very, very, very closely track silver. So I do like them because I like silver. Uh, I also like gold, though, and neither one of them is going anywhere for the while. Where is um, – yeah, all right, are we done with this? Got to get – the only thing is you got to get rid of each one of these things individually. So we talked about the overachievement of the Nikkei and why is it good short. Okay, so now we'll take a look at SLW. Is there, what is it, SLV or something? Is that a silver trust, right? There we go. 
Oh, that was stupid. I had to compare it to civil trust. There you go. So as I was saying, very, very, very close correlation between SLW and SLV, and SLW outperforms or tends to outperform over the long term. Actually, I look at the huge margin. So over the long term, SLW outperforms SLV by miles. And even over the short, medium term, you're going to generally get very close correlation or outperformance. So the thing you've got to look at when you're doing these comparisons is over time, what goes on? See, it widens. So over the longer you go out, the wider it gets and the more outperformance you get, which means obviously you're better off buying silver Wheaton instead of, SL, instead of SLV, instead of actually buying silver. You're better off buying the working company that makes a profit, benefits from hedging, so on and so forth. So, do I like them? Yes, I like them both down here because when silver turns up, they're going to turn very profitable. I don't think they're stupid people. If they're buying a mine, it's probably for good reasons, um, and there's probably some good ways to make the trade. All right. Bernie said 2136, and he said it to me privately. I have no idea what that means. I guess it's from an older conversation. Um, anyway, so we'll skip that one. Mike says, watch the robots on Fanook. That's fun. Um, <laughs> okay, so Mike says, it wasn't me who was girlfriend in the back. No, we got, we got rid of the guy who was doing it, apparently. He's uh, been muted. Pat says, can you hit participants tab above? Oh, you, can you hit the participants tab? Bring down with attendees. Yes, it did show who's muted, but it didn't show me how to do anything about it. or just, I couldn't tell who it was. Once I figured out who it was, I was able to, do, to deal with it. But yes, thank you. That was good. Um, bad oil trade for someone. I don't get that question. Bad oil trade for someone. Nope, just did what we thought it would do. See, this is what I saw now. When it gets closer to 51, then you can short it, and now it's back down here, and now you should be very cautious. But of course, you would set a stop at 50 at this point. But this, this is what I saw now. You wait until it gets close to 51, then you can start doing shorting. So that's B51, but you just know that you have a backstop here that's very likely to keep you safe. So that's when you can start making your entries at around 75. And it was a beautiful drop here. Uh, back to here, okay. <laughs> Mel Brooks, I like that. And you said, it's when we go off scripts in the webinars for whatever reason, massive market dive, technical difficulties, sort of oh, no, things are the most fun. Yeah, it's, yeah well, I don't, I don't mind going off script, but it's just I try to have a reasonable amount of time so people who listen to it later don't have to wade through like four hours before they get to the point. So, getting to the point, good, good, good way to get back to where we were. Oh, Bernie says that was the support line he was calling on, was 2136, for those of you who were checking. Okay. Oh. And again, I want you guys to say that when we're talking about the five percent rule, I'm, I, I round, don't don't take those numbers too seriously. It's just a it's it's a rule we made up. <laughs> okay, it's not like it wasn't handed down by God on Mount Sinai. It's just a it's just a rule that I made up that works. It works very well, frankly. I, you know, but we used it based on things. So, but but we're estimating it's based on an estimate and then another estimate and another estimate. So it starts out with an estimate where I look at a chart. And I say, well, where do we consolidate? So I look at a long-range chart, and I say, oh, well, look at that. That's a nice support at 20. So if I want to calculate silver wheat, and I'm going to look for 5% moves around 20. Now, 5% of 20 is only uh, 1, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're looking for $1 moves around the 20 line. So 20 and 22, I want to see significance. We have um, 19 seems to be holding up okay over here, 19 holds up here, 19 holds up here. So now I say, well, we have pretty good support at 19. And we haven't really gone lower than 18, except for those two little spikes that I wouldn't worry about too much when they happen. So if I wanted to construct something very quickly, I would say, okay, I want to construct a trade where, uh, where at least I'm down at 19 or hopefully $18 as my entry point. And then I feel very confident going long on a trade because I don't think it's going to go long. I think to, I think 20 is good support, and if, even if we have a bad incident, I think this channel will hold down to about 18, which is a 10% drop, of course, from 20 from there up. And then on the way up, I would expect 
since it's a 10% move to get to this 50-day move, I'm sorry, 200-day moving average, I would expect trouble here and expect resistance going back up. And then once we break out of there, it's going to be clear sailing for a nice move higher. And of course, it all depends on silver in that case. But I'm saying that's how you use a 5% rule. But it's just, it, it, it's just like that. It's just like you pick a line. You say, I see good consolidation here. This is what I think is going to happen. And if it's going to happen, then this is what I expect. And then if your expectations fail, you have to say to yourself, well, that's not working then. I either did something wrong with my lines, or this particular stock doesn't trade along the 5% rule. And a stock that doesn't trade along the 5% rule is usually because it's not being traded by computers. So if it's being traded more by people than computers, which is a rarity these days, but if it's traded more by people than computers, then the 5% rule won't hold up very well. But when something's being traded by robots like the Nikkei, it's almost to the penny, the 5% rule. It's an amazing thing. All right, so. Um, Hedging, right. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, you guys. Yeah, it's like too many topics. All right. So today we talked about hedging. The article is about hedging or the need for hedging. And, and this is a very, very important point I made was I said, look, we buy health insurance even when we're healthy. And we buy fire insurance even though we don't think our house is going to burn down. And we buy it because we have so much invested in our health, and, not, and obviously not physically invested, but you have an expectation that you're going to get up and go to work for the next 20 years. And even if you make 50000 a year, you expect to make a million dollars over the next 20 years. You expect to make a million dollars. If you don't make a million dollars, that would be bad, bad for your current finances, bad for your future finances. So you buy life insurance to protect you. Um, and of course, there are then mitigating factors. You say, well, if I die, I won't need as much food and I won't have to worry about my retirement. So maybe you don't need a million dollars insurance. Maybe you need a certain amount, but if you die, then your wife needs some money, right? She still has to live. So maybe she can get by on half as much. Then so you say, okay, half a million dollars. Then you say, well, if she gets to half a million dollars now, now then that money then gets invested at 5% or 10% a year, and then that's actually going to be a lot better, so maybe I can get by $250,000 worth of insurance. You know, so the, all those calculations come into play for insurance, right? So it's not different for your investments. You got maybe an IRA, you got 401k, you got um, – you have whatever you have in your current stock portfolio that you're actively trading. You do have your homes. And you know, when you're hedging, you really need to think about your overall financial picture and where you have your money tied up and what's going to be affected. Um, in the old days, in the old days, like, like, like 10 years ago, people used to have their money in stocks and bonds. And then usually when the stocks went down, the bonds would go up, and when the bonds went down, the stocks would go up, and that was hedging. But that didn't happen anymore. The uh, oldest bullshit with the central banks has broken that relationship to some extent, and you can't count on your bonds saving you when the stocks go down. You can't even count on the bonds paying you back. Um, you can't count on stocks saving you when the bonds go down. Everything crashed at the same time when we had a big crash. So. That's not a hedge anymore. Uh, allocating money into cash isn't a hedge anymore when you have countries that devalue their currencies 15% uh, you know, in, in six months, when a major country like Japan devalues their currency 18% in six months. Um, you can't even count on cash as being a good storage of assets. And, you know, like me, I've got my college funds for my kids. I've got some uh, retirement accounts, so on and so forth. got money in stocks, but I also have some homes. You know, you have to think of all the different assets you have and how you have your money. I have a business, of course, and a couple of businesses. Um, you have to think of all the ways you have money and how it will all be affected under different financial situations. And then you have to think about what kind of insurance you need and what do you need to cover. So we talk about hedges. You have to think very hard about um, what it is you have and how much you need to protect and so on and so forth. And um, and you don't want to over-insure. This is where I get back to the guy with the life insurance, okay? So if I'm earning $50,000 a year, I'm 50 years old now, 
I'm earning $50,000 a year. I expect to earn it for 20 more years. So I expect to earn a million more dollars. Um, and like I said, why do I need my million dollars? Okay, so I already have my kids' college funds to put away and paid for. So I don't need, that's not my worry, but, I, but my kids' college funds are in stocks. It's in one of those, you know, protected doohickey accounts, but it's, it's in stock, it's still invested. Um, so I, it's in stocks that I can't mess around with. You can't, like, change them over all the time. They, they, they have rules about it. Um, so I have to guard those against a downturn in the global economy. So I have a mix of U.S. and other equities and some other stuff. Um, so I have to guard those against the global uh, equity. So I, need, I do need protection there. Then I got my house, which has to, uh, which will be paid off. Um, then I've got to worry about my wife having some money, and then I've got to worry about my kids having some money, and them expenses until at least they go through college. So if I die, I need X. So I don't need a million, because like I said, if you have 500000 tomorrow, they don't need a million, do they? Because I'm, I'm not there. I'm not taking up any cash. And they can move to a smaller house or realistically downsize a little bit. And... Uh, and then uh, also the fact that they get the money up front allows them to make some more money. Now, I'm going to try not to die, Chrissy, especially uh, in the near future. I'm going to try to make more than $50,000 a year, so it's not really a good example. But I'm just trying to get like a, a, a nice, easy thing to play with. But the point being that, um, you know, you have to make these plans. You have to have a plan for what if there is a disaster, what if something goes wrong. And you've got to do that with your portfolio, too. It's completely unrealistic not to hedge your portfolio. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I hate to say things, but I mean, tomorrow, we were just talking about in chat, in fact, about, like, why it's bad for Iran to have nuclear weapons, because it's not so much that Iran's going to bomb Israel, it's that Iran can give a nuclear weapon to a uh, terrorist, and the terrorist can go to Times Square and blow off a nuclear bomb, and New York becomes a, a smoking pit. All right, so if you think about that, and, and, and you would, be, you know, with no warning, you could wake up tomorrow and Wall Street doesn't exist. That's the world we live in. I, I'm a, I, you know, I'm a New Yorker, so I, I lived through 9-11. I went through this stuff. I saw in one day how fast everything changes. And that was just a building. In one day, our infrastructure fell apart. The telecommunications, they, they happened to hit the building that had the main telecommunications hubs. The freaking cell phones went down. Everything went down. We had no cell phone service in New York for about uh, for a day. That was freaky. I mean, for, for there to be an attack like that, and you're hearing rumors and seeing stuff and whatever, and you don't even know what the hell's going on, and you couldn't trade. You were locked. We were locked for, what, three days? I think the market was closed. For three days, you just sat there and said, I don't know what the hell my, my, my portfolio is going to look like in three, when it opens. It ain't going to be good, though. That's, <laughs> that was one thing you knew. Now, imagine if we had a little hedge at that time. Though. All of a sudden, I, I, you, you, I don't want to say you're happy, but it's like, you, you know, when you have a hedge and something bad like that happens, you're like, oh, my God, I'm going to be so rich. It's a whole different thing. Um, it's, it's about having insurance. And the nice thing about this kind of insurance is you're not dead and your portfolio is not dead, but you get a big giant injection of cash. And the greatest thing about getting that cash is you get this cash from your portfolio insurance right when everything gets cheap. All right, so now let's put it into like some real context, okay? So if you've got, a, if you've got a, well, who, who had a question that had some numbers on it? Um, so Scott said, he has some custodial accounts, each about 350, they're fully invested U.S. equity, some type of calls, two and four year time frames before going, the accounts start being tapped, well, basically, okay. First of all, there's no rule somewhere to say, oh, 350, do this, okay? You've got to know what a, what, a, what a drop does to your portfolio. You've got to do that by trial and error. Today, we had a, what, where, where are we at now? We're down to a half a percent drop. So you have a half percent drop today 
you've got to always be writing this down. How much money do you lose on a half percent drop? How much money do you lose on a 1% drop? What do you lose on a 2% drop? What do you gain on a half percent gain? So on and so forth. You need to know those numbers down cold. And then you have to construct a scenario. All right, so let's go to uh, what, what do we do in our long-term portfolio? Because here you go, we have a long-term portfolio. It's at 31.5% uh, of the moment. And um, so we have, we have uh, $650,000 about, um, we have most, we'll, it, it, except for $110,000 is all in cash. But, but that's cash, but we still are using margin. Then we're using um, 500,000 of margin. So we're using about half of our portfolio's buying power, assuming ordinary margin. We're using half our portfolio's buying power uh, to have roughly uh, five, six hundred thousand dollars worth of positions. All right. Now we know from our experience that we are we don't really have we we are well hedged. These are these are almost all covered. We have we have naked uh, short puts, but not that many compared to the bulk of our positions. If, I mean, if you look at the, the, the dollar volume here, we have. Um, 30, 40, 50, 50, dollars of naked short puts. You know, it's not huge. Um, we have a really big call on USO. We have a twenty thousand dollar call on USO. Um, but here's where the money is. We have a lot of Apple. Okay, we've got twenty nine hundred, whatever hundred. There's more Apple down here, right? We have oh, here's another hundred. So we have we have one hundred fifty thousand plus of Apple. We've got, um, here's some miscellaneous, 25, I mean, you say miscellaneous, here's 50, 60, $75,000 here, and here we've got a lot. Then we've got about 300,000 of, of whatevers, right? But all these whatevers are, um, they're buy rights. They're all, they're all artificial buy rights. These, they're, they're, they're generally a bull call spread with a short put. So, should the market really totally crash? What do we know is going to happen? Well, first of all, we're going to be on the hook to buy all these stocks. So we're going to have about $300,000 worth of stocks that are going to get put to us. That's thing number one. So there's a, a major need. If the stock market drops 20%, we need $300,000 in cash. We have it because we're not fully invested, but we don't want to use up all of our cash if we have a drop. Um, but that's if it drops 20%. That's not really our primary concern right now. Then we've got these short puts, same thing though, we'll be put those too. So now it's up into about $400,000 at a 20% drop. And we've got Apple and stuff like that. So, you know, figure, figure we'll need almost half a million bucks if it drops 20%. But it doesn't mean we have to hedge 20% right off the bat. So what do we do? In our short-term portfolio, we didn't put the hedges here. We don't put them in our long-term portfolio. We put them in our short-term portfolio because we're more likely to fool around with them and change them. <clears throat> We're also more likely to take quick profits on them. So in our short-term portfolio, we, we took these SDSs because we were worried that we'd get a quick drop in the S&P. That did not happen. So it's a loss, but it was only 1750 bucks. That was just a poke in case there was a quick money to be made. There wasn't. End of story. We, we didn't roll these. We decided not to even roll these because we had no faith in them. We have these SQQQs that take us to January. So we've got $26,000 worth of those. We've got... Um, This fast turns out to be a short. Um, oh no, not here it doesn't, does it? Hmm. Long call, short call. I thought we had something else on FAS. Oh, there they are. Yeah, I knew it. Okay, so we have we have we have several short positions on fast. That's a hedge also. There's twenty thousand bucks there. I knew we had something else on that position. Now we have these TZAs for we have five thousand bucks here. We have these XRTs that I forgot all about, and um, we've got $4,000 there. We've got these TZAs, we've got $10,000 here. Uh, we've got these EWJs. Oh, I forgot we went to that confusing position too. Ah, that's interesting. All right, we have this confusing, T, um, we have this confusing EWJ position that I wish I might have stopped that at, but we're still okay. Um, and then we've got more TZAs, and here we have a huge position, $20,000. So 
we have a ton of protection, uh, uh, roughly 50, I'd say $75,000, dollars of shorts that, and, and we could do the math one by one, but I know that we're going to have at least $300,000 in cash if the market drops about 10%. So that's another thing about the protection. I don't think, now first of all, we know that there are breaks that they put on the market. So I don't need to protect myself against a 20% drop in one day. I do need to protect against a 10% drop in one day. That's the most it can fall in one day. Um, in theory, this is only in theory though. In theory, if something horrible happened and the markets were closed and they didn't open for a week or whatever, they still would only open down 10%. I don't know, it hasn't been tested yet. They haven't tested those breaks on the market. It hasn't, it's, it's silly when you think about it, because if things are, if, you, if you're selling and panicking and people are freaking out and things open 10%, who the hell is going to actually buy at 10%? To me, it'll just drop from 10% to 20% in five minutes, and then they have to close it again, and then they'll have to open it the next day, it'll drop from 20 to 30. So <clears throat> not all that helpful. Uh, although we, on the other hand, are very clever traders, so we could probably figure out how to, how to do something with that. Um, but the point is, from an insurance perspective, I, it's, it's at least mitigating $300,000 worth of damage on a 20% drop in the market seems like a good amount of protection for us. So that's where we're at roughly. If the market does start to fall and looks weak, we can always add more hedges and add more hedges and add more hedges. That's the easy thing for us to do. So it's the immediate insurance of the stuff we have to sleep on that we want to be covered for. And that's what we've done in the short-term portfolio. We picked up about uh, $75,000 worth of hedges against our $600,000 worth of long position. So, and again, we're not mitigating 100% of the damages. If, if we lose $600,000 on the long-term portfolio, which, which we won't because it would be a wipeout, but we, you know, we could go negative quite a bit. But if we, went to, if we lost, you know, if we went negative 500,000, what would happen is we'd go positive 300,000 in the short-term portfolio. We then take that money, put it in the long-term portfolio, and we, and we accept the assignment of those stocks at the very low prices, and then we wait to see if it turns around. Now, of course, we still have... 200,000 left in the short-term portfolio, and we would re-hedge because now we've bought more longs, and we would do more hedging in case we go down some more. But then hopefully, we don't go down some more and we recover, all right? But if you think about it, look at the position you're in. Um, you know, let's say the only stock we have is Apple, and Apple is, um, <clears throat> what, 120-something, 127? 129, all right. So Apple's at 129. So if Apple drops from 129 and goes down 20%, which would be uh, down to like 105 or 103, all right, what's going to happen? Well, we, we actually, frankly, wouldn't even bother us because our hedges are so low. We've, we've been Apple for so long, our hedges are even lower than that. But if Apple dropped down to 105, let's say we were signed at 100, right, some more Apple. So we lose $30,000 on Apple because it went from 130 to 100. So we lose 30,000 bucks on Apple, but our hedge pays us $15,000 back, all right? So we do lose 15,000 in the long-term portfolio. We put 15, 000, we lose $30,000 in the long-term portfolio position. We put 15,000 cash in. We put that cash to work buying more Apple, buying the, buying the, the Apple that's assigned to us. And now we have though <clears throat> twice as much Apple at a much lower base price. Then if Apple comes back and goes back to 130, we're going to have twice as much Apple with a better profit than we had last time it was at 130. In the short-term portfolio, we're totally fine because we still have the 200,000 we started with, plus we threw the extra cash in the long-term portfolio. All right, so it's, it's a little tricky to like think about, but it's a dynamic where you, you know, use one portfolio to feed the other. And it's just like in the old days where you would have stocks and bonds, except now we have long-term positions and we have short-term hedges. Instead of stocks and bonds, we're using the, the separate portfolio to manage your short-term risk. And it's hard, to, it's, it's hard to envision until you go through it. But when you do go through a correction, and you see how it works, you'll go, oh, okay, now I get it. 
<coughs> excuse me. So, um, so those are the hedges we have in place now. And let's talk about them again. We have this one directional hedge. These are, this is a very aggressive hedge, but it was small. Didn't work out. We didn't get rejected in the S&P where we thought we would, so it's kind of dead now. We have this, um, hang on, let me see what the s and is doing at the moment. Yeah, it's bouncing already. All right. Um, this one is a January call, so obviously we have a lot of money in that, and it's January. We thought that we'd take advantage of a pullback in the NASDAQ and cover. That never happened, so we're going to have to think about about what we do with that. I'll, I'll do a, uh, we'll do portfolio moves. Well, we'll look at them closely anyway, uh, you know, on Thursday, I imagine. We've got a, a long position in oil, but that's kind of irrelevant right now. Um, so, these are two shorts on FCO. I'm not worried about those. They will, they're going to pay off 100%. Um, FXI, we were short in case China melted down. So far, nothing like that's happening. Kona didn't go down enough. We blew that one. That was stupid. Um, as I said, we have this fast position. We're generally shorting on the financials. We have KBH is irrelevant. It's a separate concept play that we're in. Uh, TZA, here's, a, here's another January one. So it's a long-term hedge. Uh, UNG, we're just long on natural gas. That's fine. We don't worry about that. Um, XRT is short on retail, but it's small position, not really a hedge. It's just a bet. Uh, TZA again. Now these are July and March. All right, so that's a, that's a more short term, a little bit of a short term spread, and it's working out just fine. So we had we sold these for 230, we bought these for 230, we sold these for 50. Now we can buy these back for eight, although we don't have to because it's going to expire worthless. But we but we these will expire worthless, and these are down to 214. But we didn't lose money; we made money. We lost 15 cents over here, and we made 50 cents over here. I don't mind doing that every month. All right, so that's our insurance. That's another thing, by the way, is once we have the insurance in place, then the cost of insurance to extend it for another three months and another three months and another three months gets much cheaper. And that's another way that these portfolios over time, as they mature, they get more and more useful because it's cheaper now for us to insure than it was last year. Last year, we spent a ton of money insuring so much. Um, I mean, it's, it's hard, you know, we made a lot of money in the portfolio, but we made a lot of money because we made a lot of bets a lot of different bets on different things that made up for the fact that we lost a ton of money with our insurance. But now our insurance is in more of a maintenance mode and we have much less need to take any short-term positions to make up the cash. You know, because it's very cheap actually now for us to insure because all we have to do is roll back an existing position. Uh, <clears throat> EWJ is our bet that Japan will collapse, which it hasn't yet, so we'll see what happens there. Um, FAS, as I noted, we're short on that. It's a decent-sized position, and we're expecting it to fall down a bit. Uh, and then we've got this very long TZA, and the SLW we just talked about, and then we've got this very long TZA, also July and March. What? Is that the same position? No, it's not quite the same position. That's interesting. Well, we have a lot of July TZAs. So somebody's betting on a bad summer, but the same, same basic concept here. So we have plenty of hedges. Uh, if NASDAQ is solidly over 5,000, we're probably going to cut back on some of our hedges and get a little more bullish. But right now, we're just very, very well protected. And it's hurt us because we're down about 10,000 bucks or 15,000 bucks this month from where we were last month. Uh, we missed some of the rally that came in. But on the whole, I'd rather protect these positions, and that's the cost of protecting our positions. All right, and then we'll roll and we'll project them again for another three months. So the other nice thing, though, is we did, we actually added a bunch of stuff to the long term portfolio. Let me go back over there. We added, um, I wish you could sort these things by date. We added this UBEN in February. We added IBM. We added SCX. Um, we added a new Apple. We added more apples to the long side. Uh, we added uh, Philip Morris. We added Verizon. We added um, Caterpillar. We added uh, we added Cliff, did we? It's interesting. When did we do that? Oh well, so we did. Um, I don't remember like adding that trade. Um, we added um, GoGo. 
We add, oh wow, man, we were busy. We added iRobot. We added uh, Philip Mars or Altria, whichever one is called which. Uh, we added SLCA. We added uh, SOCL. We added, in fact, that was because NASDAQ was flying. We said, hey, let's go get a square circle while we can. And uh, we added Twitter. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. And we added use the ECO. Wow. So <laughs> we added a shitload of trades. <laughs> we had a ton of longs in the last month. Um, so again, it's not like we're bearish. We're not bearish, but we think there's going to be a correction. We think it's going to be a shallow one, and we want to be ready for it. If we're wrong and it's not shallow, we're going to be very well protected for at least a 10% correction, even 20%. We can survive without a big, without much hassle. And especially because we have a lot of cash on the side, so we're really not worried about a correction so much. Um, that affects our hedging too, is how much can we afford to, to reinvest. See, there's the other thing. You talk about, you know, how much you have invested and so on and so forth. The thing is, what is your plan though? In other words, if, if you know, we have Apple, and let's say the iWatch comes out next week, which is on the 9th, they have an event, right? So let's say they announce the iWatch, and it's awful, and everybody thinks it's awful, and it looks stupid, and it's a waste, and it looks like they spent $2 billion developing what's essentially a Zoom, you know, the Microsoft uh, thing that was supposed to be the iPad, the iPod. Um, so let's say they spent $2 billion, and they got a Zoom, and everybody laughs at them. And the, and the stock drops 25%. And then the market gets hit at the same time. And now Apple's down to, now Apple's back down to 85 bucks. Cause, cause NASDAQ takes a hit and Apple drops and everything starts to collapse. And not just cause of Apple, but cause of other things in the world that go on. So it's not just about saying I have $350,000. It's about saying what do you intend to do with each stock when you're down 20%, when you're down 40%, what are you going to do? So with Apple, I can tell you for sure that we will put more cash into our trades. We will roll our long calls down. We will buy back our short put, our short calls, and we will get more aggressively bullish if they stupidly pull back to $85. And Apple is a big chunk of our portfolio here. So I already know what we're going to do with Apple, and it's not we're going to panic and sell and take a loss. So that then affects how I'm going to hedge because I'm not going to be as worried about hedging my Apple as long as I have the cash to cover the increased position I intend to take should it drop. All right? And then, then you have to go through all your positions like that and you have to think about really where you are. And certain positions you have to say to yourself, like, um, I, obviously we don't have any because we are always doing this exercise. Every, every month at least we go through all these positions one by one and we say the exact same thing to us. Do we want to really own these positions, and do we want to own them even if something bad happens? All right, and the answer is generally yes for all these guys. We have, remember Aeropostal when it was down at like two bucks, and everybody's saying, oh, should we get out of this thing as a piece of crap, blah, blah, blah. And now it's up, and now it's up thirteen, fourteen thousand $14,000. All right, um, and we, we, we bought more, if I, if I remember correctly, I think we actually bought more when it went down and we sold puts or something. I don't remember how it started, but we actually, you know, we, we, it went down and we said, well, we liked it when it was three. Why wouldn't we like it when it's two? So if you have to look at all your positions, BHI too, BHI is getting bought by Halliburton. I don't care if they go lower. They're getting bought by Halliburton. They're going to go up. Unless there's something derails that deal, they're going to get their money. All right, then you look at Caterpillar. I want to own Caterpillar for 20 years. I don't care if they go down. CCJ, yeah, a little trickier. They're actually in bad shape right now as far as their profit goes. But I like them long term. Our CLF is crazy, but we like them generally. DBA we like for food. is also in bad shape, but we like them. GoGo, like them too long term. iRobot we like long term, of course. It's our stock of the century, so we like them very long term. Lulu we like, and Lulu's been very good to us with these numbers. Um, Mattel, we like them for a comeback, although they don't like us. Uh, Philip Marsh, we like because of pot. Uh, same thing goes for um, I, this one's Altria. Emma was Altria. We like the other one too. We bought them both. Uh, Transocean, as you know, we like Transocean, of course. And they've been so so. Um, how is the Transocean thing doing? Yeah, no, terrible. All right. Um, 
SLCA, we like those guys long term. So the Wheaton we just talked about, Sokol we like, Taser we like, that's our stock of the decade. Wait, Taser stock of the decade, right? Taser stock of the decade, they're doing very well. Uh, Toyota, we just talked about how we like them in the chat. Twitter we like, of course. Uh, UCO is the ultra long on oil, we like that one. And Whole Foods, I, I, it's not a, this is not a rough portfolio, guys. I like all these things. Um, so there's no stock here that a uh, – there's certainly no stock here that if the reason they went down is because the entire market crashed, that I would want to get rid of the stock. Because I'm just going to say, hey, it's only down because the market crashed. Let's get some more. So, you know, unless, unless there's – this is what I said to people in 2009, when the market was totally wiped out and people were freaking out, whatever. I wrote an article that said, you know, the worst case scenario of the global GDP. And I said, look, unless, you, unless, you're, unless people are dying, unless the population of the earth is being wiped out, there's a certain minimum GDP of a functioning global economy. Because you don't think about it much, but there's only there's only uh, of us of us people with computers. There's only two billion of us in the world. There's five billion people who don't have a computer, and don't have a phone, and don't you know? Well, some, actually, they certainly get phones too, but they don't have computers. That's for sure, and they don't have electricity for the most part. Um, they they they. It doesn't make a difference in their life whether or not. Uh, Procter and Gamble comes out with a new version of Tide. It doesn't doesn't affect their life at all. They don't give a crap how much money Elon Musk is getting for his new Tesla. They don't care whether it's selling or not. They don't care how Ford's doing. They don't care how GM's doing. What they care about is whether they, is whether they can uh, go to the well with an empty jug and come back and carry it on their head and put water into their into their um, pots at home and cook some food that they're going to catch out in the field. All right. But even those people. Five billion of them. They generate two, three thousand dollars in GDP each. All right. So there's ten trillion, fifteen trillion dollars. Plus of them, there's some of them are, are are wealthy in their villages, have stores, so on and so forth. So then you're into like twenty, thirty trillion dollars. So those those basic basic people living living like farmer existences in the world. They're still good for $20 trillion of the global GDP, of the $60 trillion global GDP. So, if, and then plus you have to add us in. So even if we were wiped out to their level, we'd still be good for another um, uh, eight, $8 trillion figure. In, and so, so really $40 trillion is if you, if you completely took away technology from the planet, we'd still have a $40 trillion, uh, I'm sorry, wait. 5, 20, and then we'd be good for 10, 30 trillion, like half the global GDP. So 50, and that was the point back in 2009, because the market dropped 50%. And I said, that's not possible, because if you, if you took away technology from the planet, our GDP would still be higher than that. It's not a good reflection of the market. So, and then you look realistically. So you say, look, if there was, if there, if there was some kind of horrible thing, if there was a virus that wiped out half the people in, in America or something like that, you would still wake up and you would go to work and you would try to feed your family and you would do what you could to make a living. So right away, just trying to do those things, you're going to be up in the, in the $10,000. You're going to be at the Mexico level of GDP of $10,000 per person. So there's 2 billion of us who are never going to go for less than, than 10000 bucks for GDP. There's two billion of us upper crust people in the world who live in the in the internet age that we're not gonna we're gonna fight tooth and nail to stay in something that resembles a reasonable lifestyle. So you look at Mexico with a uh, twelve twelve to fifteen thousand dollar per capita GDP. That's the base for us. We're probably not gonna fall below that level unless something incredibly catastrophic happens. So now you take two billion of us times fifteen thousand bucks. That's thirty trillion dollars. And you add that to the $20 trillion base, and you say that $50 trillion is really the bottom for the global GDP. Well, so if the global GDP now is, say, let's say $65 trillion, and the base of 7 billion people is going to be $60 trillion, I'm sorry, it's going to be $50 trillion, then really you're only talking about a 20% drop in the market before you're hitting the worst-case scenario. So can we drop below 20% for a 
for a longer period, for a period of time? Sure we could. People panic all the time. That's exactly what happened in 2009. But then at a certain point, reality kicks in and people want diapers and people want a microwave oven and people want a refrigerator and people want a bathtub and it doesn't matter. Some way, somehow, these things have to be produced and somebody is going to be willing to do to exchange their labor for those items. So that's why you don't need to hedge against an incredible catastrophe. It, I mean, yeah, if a meteor hits the earth, if, if a huge virus wipes out half the population, blah, 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 then you've got to make some serious changes in your thought process about what's going to happen. But as long as there's 7 billion relatively healthy people running around the earth, you're not going to get much more than a 20% pullback in the market that's going to last for any long amount of time. And, and by the way, when I say 20%, I mean 20% off our baselines, which are our must-hold lines. When you look at our big chart, we have the must-hold lines. Those are the baselines that we feel have strong support based on the metadata of the economy. All right? So when you start hedging, you don't want to overhedge because this, you, know, you get to a ridiculous point. It's like I was saying about with a guy, if I'm, gonna, if I'm only capable of working for 20 years making 50000 a year, I'm only going to make a million bucks. So paying for $2 million of life insurance makes me worth more dead than alive, for one thing. And second of all, it's wasting my money because what if I don't die? It's just money down the toilet. Same thing with your hedges. You have to hedge intelligently against what realistically would be a drop in your portfolio. And you have to look at it carefully, not just say, oh, I'm going to guess. Don't guess. Think very carefully about how much money you need if the market drops 20%. And, not, and need doesn't mean cover 100%. Need means mitigate your damage by 50%. You only take a 10% loss if the market drops 20%. That's a good hedge. You don't need to hedge everything. Just have some ready cash available so you can make some adjustments. That's all. Then you ride it out and see what happens. All right? So that's my speech on hedging. And, if, and as far as what's a good hedge right now, um, I still like the ones we have. I, I, I honestly, I was just looking at them. I don't, I don't not like the ones that we have now. I like these. Uh, I win the long-term portfolio. Back to the short-term portfolio. I like these SQQQs in January. They're down to four bucks now. That's a lot cheaper than we bought them. And they have the 27 calls, and they're cheap because the Nasdaq's so high. And the idea would be when SQ, if, if the Nasdaq does get rejected then you can sell some higher calls. And so if we look at SQQQ, and that was this January, next January, that was this January. So we looked at, we have the January 27th. They're, well, they're more than four bucks, they're 430. See, that's a cheating price in the portfolio, it makes it look worse than it is. So they're really about 430. With SQQQ at 25 bucks, so it's a little bit so they're out of the money. In fact, we should probably roll them, but I'll, we'll have to make those decisions later. But if, if you know, if if that's a 40 cent roll to go down a dollar, and this one's a 40 cent roll to go down another dollar, then for 80 cents we can move down two bucks and be on the money. That might be a smart move with that. But the point being, when it pops, then we could sell one of the higher calls. Like look at these guys; these guys are three bucks. So we could sell the 34 calls right now for three bucks, and 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 that that gives us three dollars back on our four dollar call on our 4.30 call. So it's net 1.30 for the 27.34 bull call strip. All right. Or if you go to or if you go to the uh, if you go down to here, you can pick these guys up. Like I said, I don't know what they are, but let's say you can get these for 4.50 to 25, and then we can sell. The 30s, well, maybe the 30s, yeah, it's hard to say because the spreads are so crazy. But, all right, let's go back to these. So you do 25 and you sell these for, for three bucks. And then you say, four, so 450, if you can get these for 450, the 25s, and you can sell the 35s for three bucks, that's $1.50 on a $10 spread. That's probably one of the best hedges out there. Um, I don't know if you can do that, but if you want to, you know, if you get it, why not? But the point being that if you can fill these for 450, and like I said, I want to try to roll these. These are 430 for sure. We know that. No, these. Okay, these are 430. These are going to be 510. I'm sorry. These are going to be 510. Realistically, then you can sell these for three bucks, and you're in 210 on that spread. And oh, and these are. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a 35. So if you can get even two, if you can get 210 
on that spread, you're in good shape. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to roll down first for 80 cents, hopefully. We're going to be in these calls for 510. And then when we get a pop, hopefully we can sell these things for four bucks. All right, and that'll put our net down to down to like a dollar ten. So if we net a dollar ten, and now we have a dollar ten, and up to ten dollars comes back on a move down the Nasdaq. Any move down, in other words, unless the Nasdaq is is at five thousand or more, we're going to make money on that spread on that hedge. And if it and if the Nasdaq isn't over five thousand. I'm sorry, if it is over 5,000, then we know that our apples are going to pay off. We know that our other, our other, pay, our other NASDAQ uh, plays are going to probably pay off because we have conservative plays that are already in the money and all we need is time. And the longer the NASDAQ stays over 5,000, the more we'll make in the LTP. So those are calculations we make as well. How much money do we expect to make if the hedges don't pay off? You have to know that too. And that way you make sure you're not overspending on your hedges. All right, so, uh, da, 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 and, then, and then we have the TZAs also. How come you usually sell calls on SAS versus buying puts on SAS? Just because I don't want to play like 10 different things. I, we have a SAS spread, and I like playing it, so I do that. Um, yeah, that, buying, well, Buying puts on FAS is a very good is a good strategy, but we're we're playing in a different way because we take the long position on FAS and then we sell the puts the calls on FAS and it's a very fast moving trade and it goes up and down a lot, but it's something you can get in and out of and make money like you make a few thousand here and a few thousand there. In fact, it was probably our top money maker last year was playing around with FAS. So you can do it the other way with FAS. It's just simpler to look at when you've got your long hedge and then you're selling short calls against it rather than mucking around with, uh, uh, you know, buying puts and hoping they pay off each time. Bernie says, which hedge does this? I'm not sure which hedge does what. Oh, what hedge protects from 20% uh, of the cues? The, the, the cues that I'm talking about here. This SQQ is an ultra short on the, on the NASDAQ. So it doesn't take a big move on the NASDAQ. It's like a two times short. So to go from 25 to 35 is what is 10 is 40 percent, right? So a 20 percent drop in the Nasdaq will pay you off 10 times or almost 10 times on the spread, or five sorry five times will pay you back 500 percent on the spread. So 20 percent down pays 500 percent on the spread. You don't need a big spread to cover yourself doing that. And again, you shouldn't be covering 20 percent. You should be covering half your losses. Are you buying or selling a call spread in S111? What? Uh, oh, SQQQ. All right. Are we buying a, no, no, we'd be buying a bull call spread. In other words, the 25, the one I like now is 25, 35, and I'm assuming you can get it for about two bucks. And you see how 320 here, 520 there, 410 here, 260 here. None of these things, it does seem like you should be able to get it for about two bucks. So if you can get a $10 spread that's at the money for two bucks, that's a good hedge. And we're not doing any, we're not even talking about offsets or anything else. It's just to straight up take some money and say, okay, because that way you know <coughs> if you buy 50 of them like we did, then you have um, 50 times 10. So you get um, 50, you, you get on, on a, on a $20,000 layout to buy the protection, you're going to get, wait, am I doing that right? No, 10,000, I'm sorry, 10, um, you lay out $10,000 for your 50 spreads at $2 a piece, and if Apple, and if, if it drops 20% of the NASDAQ, you're going to get back $50,000 on that hedge. So it cost me $10,000 to buy, to buy a, Plus forty thousand, but you know you have to consider the ten thousand spent. It's like a, it's like a bet at the track. It's like that's gone. Once you spend it, it's gone. You spent ten thousand dollars. Now I know my Apple position is going to make a damn sight more than ten thousand dollars if if the Nasdaq stays this high. My 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 Apple position is going to pay me fifty thousand dollars if the Nasdaq stays this high and Apple stays this high. So why wouldn't I take a percentage of my of my presumed profits to hedge? And now I have $50,000 downside protection. That's all. It's very simple. 
It's just insurance. You treat it like any other insurance, but, but to do it, you have to look at the same way you do with life insurance. How much do I expect to earn? How much will it affect my earnings? What will be the benefits of me collecting this money or benefits to my family of collecting the money? And what are we going to do with the money? You have to think about all that stuff. It's not like you just buy insurance. It's not a, it doesn't work that way. It's a complex series of, of thoughts that need to go into these things. How important is open interest if there's only a few under 100 or whatever, would you not trade it? Um, not really because, again, it's, a, it's an insurance bet, so um, you don't really care if there's not a lot of open interest because you're not intending to sell it. And you have to realize that, though. This bet is a bet that the NASDAQ will be lower than 5000 in one year. If it's not lower than 5000 in one year, you will lose your money. So the thing you're protecting, just like life insurance, okay, you don't get that money back, you lose it. Okay, you bet you like, you bet you pick, you buy life insurance, you're buying a million dollar policy, but if you live 20 years, you, you lose, bye. They're like, sorry, sucker, you gave us your money, but now you didn't die. Um, and not, not discussing whole life, of course, or anything like that. So this is a bet where you're saying, I have a, I expect if Apple does not get killed, if the NASDAQ stays up, I expect to make this much money on my things. As a rule of thumb right now, because we don't trust the market, because we are worried about a sell-off, we're putting about one-third, 25% one, to 35% of our, of our money that we make. Every time we make money in the long-term portfolio, we're taking a portion of it, 25 to 30%, and we're taking it and putting it into more hedges. So when we have a good day in the long-term portfolio, we take some of that money and improve our hedges. That's what we're doing. So we're protecting. Every time we gain uh, uh, $10,000, we take $3,000 and buy more hedges. We make another $10,000, we take $3,000, buy more hedges. So we're locking in the money that we gain. Every time we take a step forward, we spend a little bit of the money to lock us in place so we can't go too far back. That's the way we're treating it right now. And, and that's how come we have so many hedges, because we made so much freaking money in the last couple of months that we ended up putting more and more into the hedges, and now we have these huge hedges. So, so now we have so many hedges, we're at the point where we really hope we have a sell-off because we'd love to collect that money. Uh, okay, it's like we're going to be kind of pissed if we don't get a sell-off now we put so much money into the hedges. But we're very well protected. It's like I'm not, I'm not in the least bit worried about a sell-off. In fact, I am, I am, in fact, looking forward to a sell-off. Um, so, yeah, so don't forget these, these, you know, they're not meant to be liquid. You're not, because you're, you're not, you're not planning to do anything with them. Um, but you have to realize that, too, though, because if there's a sharp drop or something like that, you will have a hard time wriggling out of them. So you have to realize that also, these are not going to be quick in and out trades. This is just to say, I'm betting that the NASDAQ, I'm, well, you're not betting. I'm, I'm hoping the NASDAQ holds 5,000, but if it doesn't, and it has to go down and stay down, it can't just spike down. That's not the kind of trade this is, but if it goes down and stays down, that's when the hedge is going to kick in, and then you're going to get your money back. If not, though, you should be making your money on your on your positives. Um, Rich says, when you hedge the same way, purely stock-based portfolio, no theta decay if the market stays flat. Um, if you got all stocks, well, first of all, I would never do that because that's a horrible way to invest. <laughs> So, if you're not collecting dividends and you're not selling calls, I, I don't know why you're bothering. I really don't. Um, so, would I hedge? I, I certainly would hedge, but I would I would hedge and I would sell something against my long stock positions to pay for it. Yes, if there's low open interest, um, GL, you will get poor fills, or you have to be more patient. You just put the, put your offer in and wait and see if it gets filled. If it doesn't get filled, go get something else. By the way, you can do these same kind of trades with a QQQ, which is completely liquid, and you can, you can do a very similar kind of trade. I like STQ better, though, and they do fill. Okay, you, when you put the offer in, people will start looking at it and, uh, and fill it eventually. But you have to put it in, wait, sometimes wait a day, wait two days. As you see now, look at the gyrations we get. We're going up and down a half percent every single day. So you're going to get your fills. You just got to be, you know, it's putting your offers at good prices and wait until you get filled. All right, got to wrap this up. Um, I hope everyone's clear on that stuff. So, um, 
And I'm sorry, Rich, so you said about the purely stock-based portfolio. I really don't, I mean, I can't even imagine why you would want a portfolio with stocks where, you're, where you have no dividend money coming in. And you know, what are you holding them for? You're just holding them and crossing your fingers and hoping the market does well? It's, it's, it'd be, we could really do so much better. So if you're in chat, let's talk about that a little bit more because that's like, I really, I would just give me a few examples when you're in chat and I will show you how to fix them. All right, and if you have restrictions, we'll talk about your restrictions too. But, you know, there's really, you know, you got to put your money to work. To me, if you own the stock and, you don't, and you're not selling options against the stock and you're not using it, it's like if you bought a vacation home and you don't rent it out, you know, when you're not using it. Now, I know a lot of people do that, but it's a terrible financial decision. If you're that rich that you don't give a crap about the money and you can have a vacation home here and a vacation home there and you use it once a year and it's like cost you 50,000 bucks to use it for a week when you could have stayed at a hotel for 5,000 bucks instead, I don't get people who do that, but I, I, I sure know a lot of people who do it and God bless them because I get to go to their homes for free and stay there. Um, but to me, it's crazy. I have vacation homes and I rent them. Every time I'm not there, I rent them because that way I don't pay for my vacation. That way when I go, it's free. I don't give a crap that somebody else was in my house. I'm not touchy about it. Um, although, obviously, I don't have a vacation mansion. I'm not keeping Picasso's in my vacation homes. I got basic little ski houses, you know, in different places where I like to go visit. Um, but I rent it out when I'm not using it so that that way we have cash flow coming in and the home is free. So now I go on a free vacation. I enjoy that a lot. I enjoy that more than having a place to put my Picasso's. Um, so to me, that's what owning a stock is, though. If you own a stock and you're not using it to collect any revenue, and you're not uh, doing anything with it to leverage your position or collecting money or at least collecting a dividend, what the hell is it? It's just that it's you're tying up money in a random thing. That could go, it, could, it will hopefully go up over time, but you could be doing so much more with it. You know, so it's just a, it's a shame not to do it. So, yeah, please, let's follow up on that. It's one of my religious things. I really feel strongly about that. All right, guys. So one more quick look at the uh, at the charts, and we'll see how they look. Nothing much happening there. Nothing much happening there. Oil came up a little bit, but nothing, and a little bounce here, and a little bounce here. So nothing exciting at all. Sorry. Um, there's not much going on in the markets. We just have to see over the course of the week if we, things get better or they deteriorate. I think deteriorate, and I think we are going to get a little bit of a correction, at least 2% from the top, so 5,000 being the top, and we're going to be looking for a 2% pullback. It's going to be um, – about 100 points on the NASDAQ. So, it's, you know, we're not looking for a big thing. We have 19 of it right there. So today we got 20. So, you know, basically a few more days like this and we'll be happy and we have a nice correction. All right. Thank you everyone so much for coming and we'll do it again next week. All right. Take care, folks.